Hello, everybody, and welcome to the State of Craft episode 33. Uh, we got Mr. Steve uh, Conville here with us. Uh, Steve, I'm actually going to just minimize you for a bit while I do some uh, uh, housekeeping stuff, and then I'll bring you back. Oh, I did the wrong thing. Maximize you. Minimize so yourself. Cute. That's right. <laughs> Don't minimize me. I'm not minimizable. Too late, man. You've been minimized. I'll, uh, I'll bring, I'll bring yeah, you back I, I, up. And... I didn't make it easy. It was that easy. You did not make it easy. No, you made it no. hard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'll do I'll do a few things, housekeeping things, and then I'll bring you back and we'll start off the discussion here. Uh, hey, everybody. So State of Craft is uh, a podcast that happens every two weeks on the state of the legal craft cannabis industry. Uh, we got Steve Conville's guest here today. I'll introduce him in a minute or two. Um, before uh, introducing him, I wanted to do uh, some housekeeping stuff and uh, a land acknowledgement for, uh, for here where I'm at. I'll, I'll start with the housekeeping stuff um we have a, a chat so uh, you can go and ask any questions uh, or not make questions you can make any comments you want to make we, we encourage you guys to say hello uh and to interact with us throughout this experience uh, if you have any questions for either steven or myself there's a dedicated questions tab that you can go to um to ask your questions upvote the ones that you like and we'll go through that at the end um and uh, the state of craft is hosted by Certicraft, which is a uh, compliance platform that makes the ridiculous and tedious compliance requirements for dealing with Health Canada and the CRA really, really trivial and simple and takes your headaches away. Uh, and if you're interested in that, please do reach out to us. We'd love to, um, to chat with you. Um, today, I'm uh, living in Nelson, BC. I'm actually in a new place. I just uh, slept in last night for the first time. Uh, which is why it's uh, empty in this living room here behind me. Um, nah, you have no friends. Because <laughs> friends define. Because <laughs> friends terrible. define what happens in the living room. <laughs> no, you don't need a chair. Come on. I don't even have a chair. I have, I have a little stool. This is the I only thing it. I can sit I on. It. My... I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> Our technology is amazing, but we have no friends. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> so, you know, when I first moved to Nelson, my first couple years here, I was uh, uh, I was a little confused. I like didn't see any Indigenous people here. And I, I come from Vancouver, where I lived in a, in a fairly Indigenous neighborhood, where I was interacting with the Indigenous people on a, on a daily basis. And I kept asking people here, predominantly white, why I never saw anybody Indigenous. And every time I'd ask somebody, they'd be like, that's interesting. I never thought about that. I don't actually know. Um, and uh, uh, my second year here, I met somebody who did know the answer, who had worked with uh, uh, one of the matriarchs in the local Sinaix people here. Um, and uh, the answer is pretty simple. <laughs> Massacre. Uh, there's, uh, there's a scalping program in the 1800s uh, that took a population of thousands down to under 10. Um, and that's why in this uh, region, uh, there is not much of an indigenous presence relative to what it once was. So I do live in the unceded territories of the Sinaix people and through intermarriers, the Tanaha people. Um, and the history here is pretty grim and dire. And it's a history that uh, is echoed in a lot of different places in Canada, though there are other places that have somewhat different histories. So um, not all that are quite that fucked, but uh, many that are. <laughs> and uh, I encourage you, whoever you are, wherever you might be, to take the time to learn about the history of the first peoples in your area because that's the first step to any kind of meaningful reconciliation um and uh with that depressing topic <laughs> we'll bring steve no, back no, up here no 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 need listen listen first of all i i don't see that as a depressing topic it, it, i mean facts are facts um reality is reality and um uh you know there's 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 like, I mean, even Black History Month, like every every day I learn something that's been suppressed, hidden away, not told, distorted. Um, and so, and nothing can, can, can make um, what happened right. Um, you know, like realistically, you know, all Canadians are not gonna pack up and move out of their houses and give them back, but what, what we can do is, um, you know, find a meaningful and um, progressive way forward. And um, I mean, healing is good. And 
it it doesn't um, it doesn't occur if you're uh, uh, running from things, if you're hiding from things, if you're doing stuff like they do in the states. That's crazy stuff like banning topics, banning books, banning it. That's just weird. So um, thank you for that. Um, um, it's a chilling story. It's uh, something that I would never have known. Um, but uh, um, you know, now that I do, it gives me pause. It definitely gives me pause, and I appreciate you um, sharing that with me. Um, You're now, uh, now, um, let's get ready to run. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Y'all ready for this? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I mean, let's get after it, okay? Um, we're not here to we're not here to play around. We're two very serious individuals um, with a very serious topic um, or set of topics, and um, um, so I'm I'm all ears, my man. Uh, it was great to meet you at Lyft and. Um, you know, and I, 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 I consider you a friend and an ally um, in this uh, wonderful industry that is being um, constructed by who I don't know, but um, it's, uh, <laughs> and we're here, we're together, and, um, you know, it was great to be on a panel with you. I don't even know what we were talking about, but I know I was moderating. I didn't feel I got anywhere, but um, where we did get... Um, I think we had a bond because you at least answered me forthrightly and honestly, whereas others were tiptoeing. And uh, <laughs> seeing that we're not tiptoers, let's go. Let's get right into it. Yeah, that's why, that, you know, to anybody watching this, this is why I wanted uh, Steve on here because Steve was uh, happy to share his opinion, even if it like went at odds with what other people had to say. Uh, I, 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 are you are you comfortable? Well, and, and I'll, I'll I'll say this. I think I think you're okay with me sharing this. You know, Steve Steve told me that when he was asked to be a moderator, he told Lyft like, "Are you sure?" Because <laughs> I'm gonna like share. But do you do you want to share the story of, of, of that that ex encounter? Yeah. Well, no. Like I like you know they asked me to moderate a, a panel on um, um something basically why in... why why are black people in cannabis? Like, you know, basically one of those type panels. And I said, like, you know, I'm not here to, to give platitudes and I'm not here to fuck around. So if, like, are you sure? Because I'm going to, I'm going to ask the tough questions. I'm going to point out, you know, um, you know, the, 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 the lip service, um, you know, cause I'm not one for lip service. If there's not depth to, a statement i will challenge it and i said you know i i you know i don't want to be having a panel where we're just you know full of shit and we're not um actually engaging the subject matter um and uh to his credit barry uh um you know he said no 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 i want the real deal um that's why i asked you and you know since then i think i've hosted some of the more popular panels at Lyft, some of the more enjoyed, some of the more real, some of the more talked about. And I think it's because I'm not going to say, um, we just got to come together as a team. We want to try harder. And as long as we give 110%, we'll be okay. Like I don't give those Vancouver Canuck answers. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, so, <laughs> and no disrespect to any Vancouver Canucks, who smoke weed. Uh, no, wait, I don't think you're allowed to smoke weed. So I take that back. No disrespect to any Vancouver Canucks training staff who smoke weed, because we know the players do not. So let's go. So yeah, so Steve and I, uh, uh, we connected after that talk. Um, we had like a 15 minute discussion on the show floor. Uh, and it was clear there was like just a lot of stuff that uh, that we could get into and so i invited him to be on this podcast because um he had lots of wildly different opinions and uh was not afraid to share anything and that's what we love to have here people who are just uh uh down to express exactly what they think and and actually have like the experience and perspective to have like 
some real insight into uh, what they're saying. So uh, with that being said, Stephen, do you want to maybe like say a little thing about uh, chronic relief and what you've been up to and what your, your history is in the cannabis industry, and then we'll get into it? Do you want me to say that or yep. do you want to say that? I want you to introduce yourself because you know yourself better okay. than I do. <laughs> I'll do a terrible job if I try to introduce gonna, chronic exactly relief. Right. I'm like, why would I get the guy to minimize me to introduce me? That oh, check, like check, 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 check this out. Check this out. Oh, oh dang it. Ah, there we go. <laughs> I tried to That's minimize you again. Be. That's how it should be. I am maximized. Okay, so here we are. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to say shout out to Saskatchewan because that is the province where chronic relief first went live. Um, I am hoping and praying one day that the BCLDB will um, consider our brand worthy enough for your uh, venerable market. Um, but um, uh, yesterday, for the first time in our history, and um, and the first black man uh, to um, have a product that is dried flour debut on the OCS. It was a great day yesterday. Um, so um, we delivered our, our product uh, February 17th and we delivered some more um, a few days later and uh, February 17th, um, our Gorilla Breath went live um, uh, yesterday, being um, March 2nd, and on the 16th, our Island Pink, and it is a Vancouver Island Pink cut, just so you know. Shout out to all the Vancouverites out there, um, and all the Islandites out there. Um, I really uh, um, appreciate the, the legacy experience and travels that I've had that allowed me to acquire such a wonderful genetic and um our legendary strain our super silver haze which was the first cannabis strain i ever got 10 years ago um uh from my genetics library i was able to pull that out so our ocs debut is a big thing for us and we hope that um, we're able to continue our tradition and um, please as many Canadians as possible with our craft flower. So um, quickly, Chronic Relief, we are a um, uh, licensed producer. We are um, a full LP and processor. Um, we're what I call industrial craft um where we're a 16,000 square foot facility but we keep um, our flower rooms nice and tight 640 square feet we have 10 of them we crop 52 times a year we are hang dried hand trimmed never debated and never irradiated i want to say it we don't debate and we don't irradiate well actually we do debate because you and i will probably get into a few arguments as the day goes on but i will never irradiate my weed and i will never irradiate you and um uh we we um we flush well 10 to 14 days we hang dry and hand trim our small buds are nicer than a lot of swaggy big buds i've seen so yeah cool um that's us um we got a lot of genetics. Um, we love them. We pheno hunt like hell. Um, 18 months, two years for a strain to crack our lineup. And um, I, I think in total cultivars in my library and in my mother's probably have over 1,200. So um, that's who we are. And Congrats we, on, we're getting uh, down and we're exciting. Congrats on getting out into the market for the first time. That's, that's huge. Uh, I also didn't yeah. realize that you you guys had um, had uh, your uh, production space broken down into 600 ish square feet square foot uh, rooms. That's pretty cool too. That um, that uh, you guys are like treating these individual environments within your space uh, akin to yeah. a craft a craft grow and doing it all That's in that right. hand 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 processed way. That's uh, you know you've talked about industrial craft before, but I didn't know any of those details. So that's uh, 
that's cool to hear. Um, cool, man. Well, yeah, we, the name we got 10, 10 flower rooms and we roll them, baby. We roll them. We get after it. Yeehaw. Like the Calgary <laughs> Stampede. We're riding that thing like. <laughs> and we push it and we, we have a lot of fun doing it. It's not for the faint of heart. I don't do job interviews. I say, you want to work for me? I'll give you one day. If you survive a day, I'll give you three weeks. If you survive three weeks, then we'll give you three months. If you survive three months, you're high. And that's the way it goes. Great. That's cool. Um, especially for a job where your work speaks a lot more than you know what you can say on paper um yes so the name, the name of this podcast is the state of craft and it's called that because we discuss the state of the legal craft cannabis industry um and uh steven you and i have had a lot to talk about with like uh the shortcomings of the industry and the, the challenges that are making it really hard for crafts uh cannabis producers to have uh to survive let alone thrive um but before we before we get into that, I'm just curious: is there anything that you think is actually going well in the legal craft cannabis industry? Well, um, let me think about this. Hold on. <laughs> uh, okay. So, well. Um, Okay, so one thing that's really good about the legal craft industry is it's legal. And um, I don't want to overstate the obvious, but what was a fantastic experience is pulling out of the facility with 50 kg of weed in my vehicle, driving it for sale to another LP and thinking in my mind, I got over a hundred pounds of weed in this car and it is 100% legal. And that is <laughs> an amazing feeling. I, you know, I had my paperwork, everything was done and I, I did the transfer and we signed and I was thinking to myself, this is mucho cool. Like this is <laughs> really, really cool, right? So. I mean, from that standpoint that we have a legal cannabis industry in Canada, this is amazing. And it's not something that we should gloss over, glean over. You know, we are not, we are not, um, we're not waiting for bam, 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 you know, like none of that. Like I, I have, um, you know, including my temporary workers up to 50 people employed, um, you know, We've got salary, you know, we, we, we can't afford benefits. Okay, government, um, that's a problem, but I'd love to be able to give my workers benefits. Note to yourselves, I would love to be able to give my workers benefits, <laughs> but I cannot afford it right now. But the fact that people are able to make contributions to CPP and OAS and, um, you know, I'm guessing OAS is Ontario's yeah. CPP equivalent type thing. Yeah, um, um, that's old age security. Um, okay. Okay. And for those um, of you who aren't Canadian, CPP is Canadian Pension Plan. Yes, and for those of you who are not Canadian, why are you not Canadian? <laughs> We've got our problems, but it's uh, it's a great place. You, you meet people like Sammy, and then like where else are you going to meet people like Sammy? Um, and with snow in the background and and no <laughs> friends and no furniture come to canada and be savvy's friend because look at him he's all alone but what i'm trying to say is, what i'm trying to say is like weed is legal in canada and this is great like this is great uh you do business with the regulators um or the provincial bodies and you don't have to worry about collecting your pay okay because this is also something that you know we should you know celebrate um in this industry is you know when you're dealing with the provinces they pay and you don't have to have a collection practice or anything like that um and those are good things so that type of infrastructure is great yeah. but as it is a new industry we're running out of positives 
quite quickly. Um, it's hard. Um, not going to yeah. pull any punches. A lot of it was not thought about understanding how cannabis works. What was thought was we're going to get this amazing new sin. We're going to legalize it. People are going to rush to it. And we are going to tax the shit out of it. And we're going to make so much money in tax revenue that it's going to be great. Right. But, you know, unlike gambling, where the setup costs and the infrastructure costs are quite small. Now, I'm, don't get me wrong. Some guy at Caesars is saying, are you crazy, motherfucker? Have you seen our palace? No, no, no. I'm, okay, I get it. I know. But what I mean is you need a table and some chairs and a dealer, okay? Uh, weed is a very, very capital-intensive um, business where... Um, you know, it's Where all that money yeah, it's yeah. all being spent up front, and you can't make any right. money until like at least six months after you after. spent all that money and built all that facility that you right. got going on. Yeah, that's uh... and then and, and God bless the provinces, but you know, shout out to the BCLDD, um, who is a faster payer than Ontario area. But like, you know, by the time I get my first check from Ontario and thank God I'm getting one and I'm very appreciative to be able to do business with the province, but my tongue is literally on the floor. I, I'm out of credit cards to pay payroll. I am like, like, I am like, you know, it is, it is a long haul and, and you've got to be at full salary and full cost long before you get your first paycheck. And, and I don't think that that's understood. Um, I think it like people just think like you're growing weed and, and, and it's just raining cash and, you know, and they're dancing girls and videos and, and rappers and I guess gold chains and like, everybody's just like rolling in it, but that's not the, the, the case. It's, it's high cost agriculture. And if done right, there are very good rewards, but it's very hard to do it right with all of the regulations, so on and so forth. So when you say six months, <clears throat> for many of us, it was four and five years of waiting, but you had to have your lease done. So you've been paying a lease on a place for four or five years. Um, your power costs gradually increase. You're paying these rental increases, or if you own the building, you're paying mortgage after mortgage and property tax after property tax. And by the time you've been licensed and approved, then they did this thing where they said, okay, well, you can't sell to us. You have to sell to the wholesale market. But there really is no wholesale market because there's yeah, one it's buyer. Your, it's your, yeah. There's yeah, one. No, I shouldn't disrespect. It's one in and a half buyers, right? So you've got like, you know, the major provinces, which work out to be like a half, and then you've got Ontario, and then you've got the Maritimes and all that type of stuff, which I'm not trying to disrespect. Obviously they, they're cannabis and cannabis consumers, cannabis buyers, they have a cannabis market, not being disrespectful, but we're a premium craft grower. So we put our stuff in glass jars that makes them heavy, the pallets are heavy. It's not realistic for us to be able to ship to the Maritimes for smaller orders. It will put us out of business. Just those logistics things that people haven't really thought about. And so as a result, <clears throat> um, it is tough because, you know, you're not talking about six months, Sammy. As I said, for some people, it's been 72 months and yeah. then they started. And then they're told they can't sell to the guaranteed payer. So then you're in this piranha infested wholesale market where people yeah, where are you're just, selling to your competitors, <laughs> right? To build their brand with your weed. And then 
Like it's just madness. And then they don't pay you. And, and yeah, it was like wild. Right. And so now I'm at the finish line, which is really the starting line. And you're just so exhausted. And, you know, and then you've got excise and membership fees. And then there's the markups by the, the, the provinces. And, you know, like, I, I you know, like, look, I, I'm, I'm, I'm about to start exotic dancing like like really like that's like it to, to generate revenue like and, and the problem is, is is that i'm not as felt as i once were so it's like when do i get a moment to do sit-ups so that i could get a return on 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 the the, the entertainment i'm going to be providing like you know i i just it's, it's frustrating <laughs> Well, I, th I think that's a very pointed way to put it. Uh, it's, that's the reality that a lot of people have been facing. It's just like bill after 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 bill after. Oh, here's a chance to make some money. I can finally sell my stuff. Oh, the only buyers are my competitors and they don't want me to succeed. Fuck. And that's, and that's just the reality of like so many people who are on that smaller scale. Um, yeah. So that's, it, it's, that's interesting that like, you know, everything that you've shared is literally the same exact stuff that we're hearing from people who aren't at that 16,000 square foot uh, range, but in like the 2,000, 3,000 square foot range. So it's it's an identical story that uh, that you've shared here as everybody else. Uh, and just and just to clarify, the six months that I was talking about wasn't from like the start of your journey. It was from having your license and starting to produce cannabis as a licensed facility. Um, so. Uh, like like that, that it basically takes six months to even have a crop period once you've started producing that uh that you can yes but that but that but that i mean think about it um i i had a bit of more foresight and intuitive gut feeling experiences so um i took advantage of the one-time amnesty transfer so i was able to bring in active genetics if I didn't bring in active genetics, I can tell you right now, I wouldn't be here today. Yeah. Because even though I was dealing with the piranhas, at least I was able to sell some stuff at below cost or at cost just to pay some bills. But imagine you waited four or five years to get your license, you get your license and then you have no weed you got to go find someone to sell you weed so that you can start to grow weed and then they're not really your friends and then what you don't realize is that weed without a listing has no value it could be the greatest weed in the world but if there's not a listing matched up against that weed and i, I but there's a shift change at my facility. So if I just keep waving, it's not because I, I miss you, Sammy. It's just I'm saying <laughs> bye to people. Um, but, um, you know, like that took me a while to learn. Like I've grown some great weed, but unless there's a provincial listing and people are short on their inventory to supply a regulator, your weed is worthless because there's really one buyer. And that was that that's that's where it's really tough for the Michaels because if you see my gut, but maybe it's because I'm 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 a I'm a black man and I'm inherently nervous of 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 all kinds of things, right? Um you know, all of the experts, why would you bring your mother room? Why would you bring a nursery? Just turn that all into flower space. Turn it all into flower space and grow so, but then how do I go to the regulator or the body and, and, and say, oh, here's this competitive product that I have to offer you. Can I grow for you? Because what happens is if you don't have any genetics, and this is where like a lot of micros get screwed, is that they don't have the square footage to mom out, right? Whereas... I have square footage that I've dedicated to my genetics, which I keep saying to the boards, hey, do you want this? And then, you know, one board will say, no, right? Well, do you want this? No, do you want this? No, do you want this? Hmm. 
maybe oh how about this or how about this or how about this, or how about this? and then eventually they say yeah 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 yeah, yeah. It's send that send that okay fine but if you don't have your own genetics then you're relying on somebody else to sell you genetics that the provincial board wants well, what do you do do you get a commitment that they're going to buy it and then grow well it's too late they want it in 60 days or 30 days oh yeah. do you grow a bunch of stuff and then hope that they want it well, what if they say no now yeah. you're selling it below cost to some dude who has the listing renames it and makes a bundle that's 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 the that's the rough part of this you know it's very predatory it's very very hard and you know it's not for the faint of heart you really got to be a jungle cat and that's why like you know being a full lp even though we're still craft um my costs are way higher than a micro i'm going to tell you that that the it's a wow way higher but my options are more so we're going to see in the end because maybe none of us survive, but um, if I do survive, and I should say, like, you know, my therapist says to say when, when I do survive, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, well, then, you know, then we can give, we can, we can give, we can give, um, you know, we can give some telling advice. And that's maybe when, you know, you, you micros pool. So, and it, you know you you know I know you want to be a, a you want to be a bad man you want to be a bad woman you want to be you want to be that legend right but in this system you're not really allowed to to to, to do that right so um, what I would say is you know you ha you you partner with a gen uh, a nursery and three micros or four micros come together. You want individuality, so each of you grow a different strain per cycle, but you fight to get that, you fight to get that cycle, everything from one cycle approved at the same time. So that, you know, you're all, you know, you're all using economies of scale and you're throwing, throwing fists together. That's just an idea. I don't want any revenue or royalties if it works. <laughs> um, you know what I mean? Just get at Sammy and just say, Sammy, yo, there's this guy on your thing. And he said a few things and we tried it and now we're rich. So um, we're having this party uh, um, uh, uh, Canada Day weekend and you're both invited. Uh, hail up Steve and we're going to have a good time. Like, I mean, that's all I would say. But that's that's you know that's what i'm looking at options because otherwise it's crazy yeah you, you bring you bring up you know some thoughts in my mind because you know we, we work with a lot of micros uh, at Surcraft. that's kind of where, where we started there's a lot of micro grows i think our first like 60 or 70 customers were all micro growers no we had we had a few standards there too uh, but on a smaller <laughs> scale and you know for all of those facilities most of them had history in the legacy they done all their pheno hunts for at least a decade before that they're bringing in fire genetic with them but they were all they all kind of had this assumption um, which i don't know if it was valid or not for each of them i can't really speak to the experience of every single one of our customers but they had this assumption that hey we're going to grow a fire it's unique original genetics doesn't exist anywhere else and then we'll be able to sell that and now you're making me think like i wonder how many of those people found after growing all that weed that actually they couldn't sell that fire genetics just because they couldn't reach the right person to get a listing at, I mean, either way, they, they can't create that listing because they don't have a processing license. So they're relying on somebody else to create a listing for yeah. them. And, uh, but yeah, that, that was an angle I hadn't really considered about how much that can really damage somebody and you know and it's a reasonable assumption to make that hey if i have original genetics, genetics. that's fire that people love that i won't have any problem selling this but then you're sell you're not selling directly to the actual buyer you're selling to no. a middleman that does not have your best interest in mind and so or <laughs> or not just that you've got a you, you're selling to a middleman that 
benignly doesn't know what they're doing. And that and the purchaser at the province may or may not have the pulse of the of the end user in mind. And then that person it has the product being delivered to a dispensary that is also quality gated. And as a result, you may not have the pulse of the consumer of their own consumer in mind. And so ultimately the end result of that is, is that you've got a four or five level broken telephone between amazing cannabis and the end consumer. That wants so, that amazing cannabis. Yes, but it may never ever arrive. So so Steve, with can I, can I call you Steve or do you prefer Steven? Steve, Steven, just don't call me fuckface. No, I'm just, just joking. <laughs> well, <laughs> fuckface, I'm going to call you that. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Steven, uh, <laughs> so at Chronic Relief, the sense that I get is that the way you guys went about addressing this problem is what you talked about. You know, we decided to go for a full LP license, processing, cultivation, the whole shebang, you know, a sales amendment. We're doing our own package runs. We're developing relationships with these provincial distribution boards. Are you guys also going out to dispensaries to like help them become aware of uh, of your product and your brand and your genetics? Is that we, a part we have to. We have to. So I had the benefit of being a stockbroker, and I was the 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 recipient of the wholesaling process. So all the mutual fund companies, all the structured product companies, all the bank investment banks, all of your internal people, all had salespeople coming out, pitching me on, this is why your clients need this great product. So very quickly, I realized that we gotta have a, a, an, an institutional salesperson. Right. I mean, there's, there's, you know, close to 2000 LPs, right. One buyer and then 1000 stores, let's say in Ontario. Right. So how's one category manager going to disseminate effectively my message to a thousand dispensaries in the face of 2000 LPs? Like, like, so because of my previous professional experience, I was like, whoa, we're going to need to create that market. We're going to need to make people know our name in the face of not being able to advertise. It's very tricky. Very, 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 very tricky. Um, and as I say, when we survive, um, you know, thank you, Pat, positive thinking. When we survive, um, I think that will be part of the formula. But the survival, even if we do, won't be long in the face of the um, regulatory and financial constraints that are facing myself and my colleagues. So, so that makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, one thing I'm curious about, you know, you, you, you've done what you've had to given the realities of the industry to yeah. give yourselves a fighting chance. If you had the ability to change the policies and the, uh, the regulations provincially and federally uh, to create a reality where um, smaller scale uh, craft producers could not only survive, but actually thrive, what would those changes be? How would you alter uh, those policies to create a, a better reality. Okay, so the first thing that I would like to say is I don't like the us against them. I am a craft producer and I feel that if every single craft producer was at maximum production, there is more than enough buyers in Canada to consume all of that product in its entirety and us all make a good living. 
That's number one. I do not subscribe to this. Oh, there's too much weed. There's too much. No, there is not too much good weed. Yeah, it's too much shitty weed. <laughs> yes, and, and this is very important. And it's no disrespect to our larger corporate brethren. There should be one of you you know it i know it they know it you cannot lose one billion two billion six hundred million dollars a quarter and call that a business it's not a business they, there's nothing about that that makes any sense there's no oh don't worry when the u.s border opens up it presupposes that U.S. people want to buy shitty weed. No one wants to buy shitty weed at premium prices. It just doesn't make sense. But what you have is because there's such a large block, block of excise payer and provincial distributor markup, no one wants to make the first move to let that huge chunk of fake revenue go and 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 i'm and i'm and i'm not insulting the government i'm not insulting the provincial bodies and i'm not insulting my large people but if you put that math in front of a 12 year old and didn't tell them what business it was for they would say this makes no sense. And so what, and because the public capital market shareholder is subsidized. Oh, you disappear your that, video. Yeah, someone from Hamilton called, whoever you are <laughs> is not right. I don't know who it is from Hamilton. I don't like the Hamilton Tiger Cats. I don't like Hamilton. And I would appreciate it if you did not call again. And I don't know how, like, it's like my camera is off. Okay, I'm back. Whoever you were, stop it. It's just rude. So, like, we're, you know, like, we're, we're in a, we're in a, we're in a, we're in a, we're, we're in a situation where people are like, there's too much meat, there's too much meat. No, there's too much publicly um, traded, subsidized, bad weed, right? And I saw a guy like, you know, screaming about pay to play and all this type of stuff. And it's not that I, I, I you know, capitalism is capitalism, but I'm not saying I have a problem. I'm not casting any moral judgment. But the problem with the current pay to play models is that. And sorry, sorry, Steve, before, before you say what you're about to say, before you say what you're about to say, just to clarify here, when you say pay to play, are you talking about all those retail stores that basically say, hey, if you want us to carry your products, you got to subscribe to our blah, 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 which costs $30,000 or that. Yes, yes, that type of stuff. Because what yeah. it's doing is. Um, it's not a true economic model. I'm just talking from a pure business. I'm not judging anyone. I'm not pointing fingers and saying you bugger. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm just saying what you have is you have um, a redistribution of fake earning, fake earned capital subsidizing a mediocre performance so what it's doing is it's crowding out talent like it's it's choking talent right and all i'm saying is is once these markets like once these these structures that it just, there's just nothing you can do to make those companies make money they're done right and I, and again there are amazing people who work there, amazing executives, amazing QA people, amazing HR people. And I do not want to wish um, poor 
finances on anyone. I don't want to wish um, these towns that that have 95,000 workers, you know, in these behemoth things. I don't want to wish those people unemployment. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about the sheer mathematics of this nonsense. Okay. What's happening is, is you've got the shelves crowded with inferior product that is using external money to keep that product on the shelf, which is creating a, 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 a infrastructure that is addicted to that revenue because the revenue is extent, it's external, it's a flow through. So it's not sustainable. One day someone's going to say, what the fuck? I've lost like $60 trillion. Fuck you guys. I'm out, right? And on that day, you're going to have a massive void on these provincial bodies because these behemoths are taking up 40 and 50% of the shelf space. And in those large chunks of shelf space, they're paying these huge provincial markups and they're paying this massive excise, which is really fake because their losses are so big, their write downs on the other side, the government's not making any money. Like it's like, you understand? It's all fake. It makes no sense. Okay. So are they, are they, are they actually still, cause like, I can't imagine that four years in, if dispensaries aren't actually able to sell this shitty weed, I can't imagine that they would be continuing to um, mm -mm -mm -mm. buy the same products. No, the, the weed comes in, they're paying these royalty fees, these advice fees, these data collection fees, whatever the fees are paying. Oh, you're talking, weed, about, you're talking about pay to play specifically. Right. When those. Got when those, it. So. God, then what okay. happens is they're paying for prominent display locations. They're paying for whatever. But then when the weed doesn't sell, they drop it on sale. And then it moves real quickly. And then it moves real quickly, right? So then the guy comes in with a check and says, okay, here's $4 a gram. It's, it's here for $6 a gram sell it for two dollars a gram it flies off the shelf so the 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 equity market play here and, and i'm sorry you can see like you know i got the paperwork i'm not talking shit. i know what i'm talking about you see here's the here's the deal right all jokes aside is that nothing is showing up on the same side of the balance sheet right so if the federal government were able to do this, we are charging this in excise, but we're 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 giving back this in income tax. What you would see is the cannabis industry is not generating them the the revenue that they want, but what what they'll do is look at what we're collecting in excise. That's one minister. But then they put all cannabis companies in corporations and it's just blended in the whatever, whatever corporate Canada is making or losing for, for the federal coffers. For how, the how, how does, so help, help me understand something. How does the federal government lose money uh, from a corporate entity? Because I know that the federal government makes far more money with sales tax, property tax, corporate tax, income tax from the cannabis industry, like more than an order of magnitude more than excise duty from those things. So where where is the loss? Help me understand that. Because what I'm saying is, is if we had all of those companies out of the way, yeah, and we had top tier cannabis for sale. We had varieties and we had the quality. Gross cannabis sales are what they are. So HST is whole. The government's not losing HST, right? Yeah. 
on whatever the provincial markup is going to be, right? Because remember, the micro doesn't pay those excises. The micro doesn't pay those provincial markups, right? They, they, they do in a way, though, in the form of like way, way, way less money than what their weed's actually worth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah, no, no, but, but yeah, no, no. But not, not the actual giving of money. Yeah, I get, I get the actual giving of money. Yeah. So my whole point is with the bad stuff gone, and I don't wish people gone. You understand? It's just I'm just talking yeah. to math. I'm still paying the same HST, right? Because when I was on the wholesale side, someone was buying my weed and selling it retail. I was just dying, right? So the point is, I just don't know who. I don't know what province it was being sold in. I don't know what the end customer was. I don't know who, right? But these behemoth structures, right? Their write downs on $4 billion a year losses, right? They are. So, how, what, what, what is what is as somebody who is not as well versed in, uh, I'll call it tax financials. Right. When you, when you have like a $4 million write down, what what is the implication of that? Does that mean if you have any taxes that you owed on a corporate level are reduced by four million? Is that the effect of that? Four billion. So what I'm saying is these corporations, right, are accumulating tax losses. They would have to make money to twenty ninety-five before they would pay $1 of income tax. Got it, okay. Whereas if you are a, a, a business person like me, and if my company could make 10 million, right? And I end up paying 3 million in taxes. I'm happy with my 7 million to pay my workers, to distribute to this, to distribute to that, and have some little thing left over for myself and my loved ones. Okay? Cool. But the total weed volume sales will not change. What will change is that people who have a chance of profitability will be in business and we will all be paying taxes. I guarantee you, you're not going to be a small business and not pay tax. Okay. Yeah. You're not going to be here. You're, you're not going to come with no write down scheme and have CRA buy that shit. You're going to pay your fair share. Okay. And all I'm saying is, is with a redistribution of who, actually represents the sales in the cannabis industry the government would net net make more money because these companies that have lost a total like i think it's like the top five companies have lost a total of 29 billion since inception there is never going to be a day where any of them will pay income tax it's not happening that's so, so interesting. I never, ever considered all the shutdowns of those various facilities and the selling of like state of the art facilities for like $2 million and they built it for $100 million. I never considered any of that resulting in, oh, we never have to pay a tax in a day of our lives. <laughs> exactly. And so that's why I'm saying it's it. it on the surface, all the when you present one thing in one little thing, it might make sense or not make sense, and it seems very clear, right? But when you step back and look at the macro picture, it is nonsense. It makes no sense. It's not good for the province. It's not good for the the the, the country. It's not good for our future. It makes no sense. So what I'm saying is, is look, let the experts 
who are growing cannabis into the game. You know, like 20 something years ago, Tom Brady was sitting on the bench and it, no one, no one wants to wish anyone ill. And that's what I'm saying. I don't want to wish any company ill because there are good people, good hearts, good souls who get up every day trying to make something that will never work, work. Okay. And I, like, I, I don't wish anyone ill. Right. But what I'm trying to say is, is from the moment Brady stepped into the game, football was never the same. And all I'm saying is, put us in, coach. So I'm, I'm, I'm with you with everything you've shared. The, the gap that I feel like I have right now and that I'd love to hear your perspective on, yeah. how do you create that reality? How do you shift things? so that these bigger companies that are entirely exist because they're uh, living off of public investor money and uh, and that's it uh, how, how do you make it so that they are forced essentially to take a step back and create the space for the little guys who've been in the cannabis sector for decades want to be in this regulated market but can't for a whole bunch of different reasons how, how do you create that reality What's, what's the actual concrete steps that you think are realistic and possible? Not necessarily, you know, going to happen, but that are possible, not so far-fetched that we can't even consider that. Hold on. I'm looking for my wand. <laughs> no, 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 okay, look. Here's how, it, here's, here's how it goes. Unfortunately, um... We are now in a in a in a situation where um, you, you know it's not like you know it's not like you can call an exterminator or like it's like it, it, it it's it's market forces and demand and, and and all that type of stuff. It's really up to um, you know the investors you know who who have to actually have an honest look and say okay do we realistically have an option here right that process takes time because no one wants to admit that they're wrong you know people's people's livelihoods are at stake people's stuff like you know and as long as there's breath what's the beautiful part about being human that's what i love to be human like we want to make the impossible possible you know, and sometimes we do, right? Like that, that's, that's what's great about like being alive, right? So someone says, hey, Conville, do you want to take a try, a try at being CEO of X? Now I got to consider it because, you know, I want to believe in me that I can, and I'm going to fight like hell to make sure that I do well by myself and I do well by my shareholders. Unfortunately, I don't think there is a magic wand. Um, if there was some way to make um, the, the pay to play uh, environment not possible, I, I don't think there's a way you can. Um, you know, I just don't think there is, right? But if that were to be regulated out of the industry, <clears throat> then what would happen is you would see there being no benefit to carrying substandard product. And once there's no benefit to carrying substandard product, then your store will now be judged upon market dynamics. Once that because happens, because it said in, in, in other words, Stephen, just want to make sure I'm understanding you correctly here. For a lot of these retail stores that are carrying the subpar cannabis, the reason they are able to is because they are guaranteed profitability from that pay-to-play model. Is that a correct assessment? And I wouldn't even say profitability. I think the word is more guaranteed survival. Survival. Okay. Okay. Because our 
our retail partners are struggling as well. Like they're, they're dying, right? And so that's also what makes things so difficult is because between excise and the markup and the regulatory costs and fees and so on and so forth, dispensary costs are not as high as cannabis costs. They're not up against it as much as we are. But still are it's a little no, bit. It's, yeah, there's still no picnic over there either, right? Yeah. How how, so, how rampant, how big of an issue is pay to play? Like how, what percentage of stores would you guess? Let's just call it Ontario because that's where you're based out of. What would you guess if you had to put a percentage on the number of stores that do it? I have no idea. I couldn't even speculate. Um, you know, if I was put in that position, I would probably take the money. I, I can't, I can't even lie, right? It, it's like, like what, like, you know, if I have a choice of feeding my family or being some altruistic hero, I'm going to take feeding my family every single time. Right. I'm just, I'm just not sure the independents are even really invited in a meaningful way because I would be an independent, but from the rumors, it's the larger chains and so on and so forth. I have no evidence. I don't know. I'm just saying for the long term, it doesn't make our industry healthier, right? But for the short term, how could I blame anyone for trying to survive? Yeah. And that, that, you know, I mean, that's, that's the reality of it. So do I have a, a quick solution? The only way a quick solution could be found is to people subsidizing. Because in, so, in, in, in you... traditional markets, like if I'm Walmart, right, and I want to open up a Walmart gas station and your Sammy's gas station across the street, I'm going to put my Walmart gas station across the street from you and I'm going to undercut your prices and I'm going to put you out of business. That's capitalism, okay? Because I'm Walmart, I'm using my money. And and amen to Sam Walton, he built an amazing company. That's capitalism. But that's not what's happening. I'm Joe's department store. I'm losing four billion a year. And I'm using somebody else's money to put up a gas station across the street from you who's actually making money but I put you out of business using someone else's money. That's more like communism almost, you know, you, you know what I mean? Like you, you see it's nuanced, but you see the difference. I, Disagree I, I on it being more like communism, but I, I do see the difference. 100%. No, 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 but, no, but, no, but, I'm, 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 but you, you understand what I'm saying? Like, I, I, I understand I, where you're getting at. Yeah. yeah. Like, like I, I'm, I'm taking for the premise that we live in a capitalist country and we all subscribe to the capitalist system. And there are there are practices that one would consider fair in our ring that I don't think are being practiced right now. Like, cause I don't mind losing a gunfight if I have a gun. I just, I have a problem losing, losing a knife fight when the other guy has a gun. That that's That's kind of what I'm trying to say here. Yeah. No, I get, I get that, man. Um, we are uh, over time here, so um, I am going to ask if you have any uh, final thoughts that you want to share with uh, the masses on, uh, on here and eventually on YouTube. <laughs> All right. Uh, everybody out there, I live in Canada. It's not perfect. I love this country. There's all kind of shit that could be done better. You know, and I, and I, you know, and it pick a topic. COVID, what a mess! It could have been done better, but you know what? We're in Canada. It, we did our best, and you know what? I look at it and I go, "Hey, it could be a lot worse." <laughs> we're in, we're in, we're we we we've set up a legal system for weed. It's on good days, horrible, but, <laughs> but, but 
I live in Canada. And I believe in the long term, we're going to do our best to try to make it better. And I hope, no, no, as Path Positive would say, shout out. I know that when I'm still here to see these changes through, um, I will be a part of one of the more dynamic and beautiful cannabis industries in the world. I wanna shout out every legacy grower who gets down every single day, who's passionate about plants, who's passionate about quality, who's passionate about genetics, who's passionate about terpenes, who's passionate about their craft, and who's passionate about their workers and their customers. I wanna shout all of you out, big up to yourselves. We've been doing it for a long time, and we wanna be doing it for even longer. We just gotta cross our fingers, hold our hands, and, and, and you know whatever your thought is on a, on a divine entity, pray together and complain like hell and do what we can to push the needle forward. But I wanna shout all you guys out, men and women, um, because um, you know, without us, there's no industry and um, you know, big up to Certi Craft, uh, big up to all the people who are living and dying on the cannabis tip and I want you to know that um, at least myself, I'm thinking about you and I know that better days are coming. So thanks my man for having me out. I hope I was able to share something that no, this is great. some I, people I have learned, value. I learned some new stuff, man. I learned, if I've, I've uh, been very uh, deep in this industry for five years now and had lots of these conversations. This is the 33rd such conversation and yet I learned new things today and that's pretty great and I, appreciate that we, we were chatting before we went on air and uh told steven i had no idea where this conversation was gonna go uh and he was like neither do i that's why i'm glad to be here <laughs> and i'm uh really stoked to learn a thing or two about you know what what it actually means like the big thing for me has been like kind of realizing um the mechanism by which these bigger players are doing things and you know you know, Earl Earl said some stuff in the comments there. Earl Oliver, who we've had him as a guest before in the past, um, he uh, he was he was disagreeing with the communism piece too, saying that's that's raw capitalism, and brought up the example of Uber, who deliberately lost ten billion dollars American before going public to try to obliterate the taxi industry, and that that we unfortunately live in a society where a lot of capitalism isn't done in a manner that's uh ethical <laughs> there's a lot of <laughs> dishonesty no no no, no no and i and i get it was, shout out earl shout out earl i'm 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 see uh what i'm saying is is that and i'm gonna no disrespect to my insurance company okay <laughs> no disrespect <laughs> <laughs> Somehow, the tone says a different but message you're than the words. about to be disrespected, so I'm going to apologize in advance. <laughs> Earl, what I'm talking about is nuanced, okay? And what I'm saying is, is, is that have you ever tried to pay your insurance company late and maintain your insurance coverage? It doesn't happen. And that is true capitalism. But what happens with every hurricane, with every major forest fire, with every, you know what the insurance company does? Oh my God, our pockets are so empty. How are we gonna be able to pay? Oh my God, if we pay this, we're gonna have to lay off so many people and so on. And what I'm trying to explain to you is, is like, if you look at like during the financial crisis, all of the capitalist companies got very socialist and in some points even communist where the governments had to bail them out and you may argue 
that in their arguing and in their lobbying, that is truly how capitalism works. But the practice in and of itself was socialist at best and most likely communist. Where if you wanted to see true capitalism, okay, so you're, it was you're talking about like in, it's the you're banks talking about Russia, like the the banks in Russia and the banks in China that got caught up in the derivative swaps and all that type of stuff. You know what the government said? Fuck you. And they went under. That is true capitalism. And so what I'm trying to say is, is you're describing a practice allowed in a capitalist country that is not, if you look at the textbook, a capitalist practice. Okay, I, I'm glad. I'm glad you. I'm glad you explained that more. That that I can get behind. Yeah, no. If you're if you're talking about like the philosophy of capitalism as it was first created and as it was first practiced, then that that's uh, then that makes sense to me. I think I, I think I'm on the, was on the same page as Earl initially, where where I was thinking in terms of like how capitalism is practiced today in the Western world as opposed to but my, but, yeah. but, but that's but that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, but it's 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 like, it's, a, like, un, it's bastardization of what capitalism is meant to be. Right. So you you yeah. you 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 know because because these companies are capitalist when they're making money. Socialists when they're very losing money. socialist when they're losing money. <laughs> and they're the first people to lecture <laughs> <laughs> welfare moms. Yeah. You understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah, no, I get so, so we're I, we're on the same page now. We're on the same page. Thank, thank you for clarifying. I appreciate that. And shout out to <laughs> Earl. I don't know who you are, but you sound like a cool dude. <laughs> Earl is a pretty cool dude. I, I always like having chats with him. He's also a very opinionated person who's unafraid to say exactly what he thinks. I think you guys would have a, a good conversation if you ever chose to chat sometime. Um all right. Well, I said that. Would you like to say any final words? Because we're wrapping up, and then we had another like little discussion after. <laughs> yeah, do you have any final? Do you have any final words now? Yes, yeah, this, this is this is the final words right here, right now. <laughs> For ten years, my dogs have been behind me. I want to shout out my team at Chronic Relief. I would not be here without you. Every single last man or woman on my team, God bless you. I love you. And we are excited about the products we are bringing to the Canadian market today. I don't know if the system is capitalist. I don't know if the system is communist. I don't know if the system is somewhere in between, but we are glad to be here. And we are, as my therapist has said, when we are successful, we will be so glad that we are in Canada. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. A pleasure having you here today. Uh, next up on the State of Craft, next week we have got uh, a bit of a different episode, actually, than anything we've done so far. Uh, we have uh, uh, a registered nurse. I forget what the exact like title is. It's a therapeutic nurse. Somebody who is like specializes in the endocannabinoid system uh, and is the biggest expert I've ever met on uh, the cannabis system in our bodies and how it works with uh, terpenes and cannabinoids. And she is going to give us a deep dive into her work. She works with medical patients uh, all the time to help help tailor an exact prescription that works perfectly for their bodies, their needs, and where they're at, and is a, uh, works with them on a regular basis. Met her at Lyft as well, actually. Uh, her name is Kayla. I forget her last name, uh, but she is heavily involved in the Alberta uh, medical cannabis community and uh she blew my mind with some knowledge that she dropped on me at lyft really helped i was i had a bit of a rough time there with just a lot going on and she helped me out with uh cbd being used in a way that i never thought it could be used and uh um anyway because she blew my mind a few different times and she's very eloquent and capable person who does a lot of cool stuff uh in the cannabis space i invited her to be on the podcast as well and she is going to be our guest in two weeks um, Shout out to her. That's amazing. My mom, RIP, was a registered nurse. Um, God bless RNs. And um, I'm really excited to hear what she has to say, too. Awesome, Steve. We'd be glad to have you back here. Thank you all very much for being here. If you liked what you heard here today, please subscribe to our channel. Uh, and uh, excited uh, to see you next time. Thanks again for your time, Steve. Bye-bye. Thanks, brother. Take care.